So hi, I'm Leah Kistner, and I'm here to talk to you today about when things go wrong. Now, to, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from on this, I spent nearly a dozen years at Google uh, working on security and privacy, and I'm not going to name incidents, but let's just say I've worked a few in my day. After I left there, I went to Humu, where I was the chief privacy officer. One of the first things I did there was rewrite the incident procedures. And then I headed to Zoom for a few months in the wake of their public and exciting security and privacy issues to try and help them. So I worked emergencies at small, medium, and large companies. And I wanted to share with you some of the things that I've learned in the hopes that they'll help, for you, help you. Because as people who specialize in when things go wrong on the internet, we didn't need 2020 to tell us that bad things happen. So let's talk about when things go wrong. Now, I'm gonna share with you at the end uh, a cheat sheet for this, something which you can use as an incident response document yourself. Actually, uh, this is one that I wrote for Humu, this is courtesy of Humu. And uh, our auditors there, they told us it's the best they've ever seen. So it might be a good starting point for you. And actually writing things down, that is in fact my first tip. Because it turns out that you should plan for panic. Your adrenal system in these cases is going to be very activated. You're probably familiar with the physical effects, pounding heart, trembling, things like that, but there are also cognitive effects. You are likely to interpret things as overly negative, feel rushed, and overall your capacity to make good decisions is sharply reduced. This is ironic because this is exactly when you care about making good decisions quickly. So you should plan ahead have written procedures and playbooks. Consider your hard choices when you have the leisure and the relaxation to do that in advance. You can also use some physiological hacks. When I'm in an incident and people are starting to ramp up, I will have everyone stop for a moment and breathe deeply. Um, breathe in your nose, breathe out your mouth. It is a physiological hack that resets your nervous system, which makes you be in a place to make better decisions. So let's go through the steps of handling an incident. Before you even start, assign the incident commander to coordinate and manage op uh, operations. If you don't do this, even at a small company, you are likely to get some chaos pretty fast. First step though, find the cut. What's going wrong? Who's affected? Is this an incident, a vulnerability, or a false positive? Then you should start, stop the bleeding. Stop the bad thing from going wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean fixing it, it means stopping it. And then you can clean up the blood, fix whatever's broken, make sure you understand the root cause or causes, and then put in place longer term measures to avoid a repeat. Now, this is not standard terminology. This is the terminology I use because people actually remember it in an emergency. So let's talk about step zero, assigning a commander. This person is gonna manage your coordination and operations. They are not the same person as the one doing the debugging. There's a reason for this. If you're debugging, you need to be heads down, you need to be concentrating, if you're doing the incident commander role, you need to have your heads up. You're doing a lot of communication. You're doing a lot of coordination. And you're also making sure things are written down. This is partially because when people are doing the debugging and they're kind of panicked, they are likely to try the same thing or the same fix over and over again. The incident commander is there to try and interrupt that cycle. But also we're gonna need that written record for later. Now, Another thing about an incident commander is there can be only one. It is like Highlander. There need to be explicit handoffs. So if Alice is, is handing off the role to Bob, Alice says, Bob, you're the incident commander. And Bob says, I am the incident commander. You don't want to have this fall on the cracks so nobody is the incident commander. Then make sure that everybody else knows who the incident commander is. Name them in a coordination location, the document you're using, the Slack channel, wherever. You should also consider a jaunty hat. This hat was part of the Humu uh, incident handling procedures. And the reason why uh, is partially because then everybody knows that there's an incident since we were all in the office back in the day. And then also people know who to go talk to about that incident. The other one is particularly relevant for those of us who have handled a lot of incidents. If you are the one handling a lot of incidents, people start getting really scared when you walk up to them because they're like, oh no, it might be a terrible thing again. That's not really useful for doing the rest of your job and honestly, it's not much fun. So if you use something that's a very explicit sign that you're handling an incident versus not, 
then people get scared of the hat and not scared of you. So let's move on to finding the cut. So we're gonna ask ourselves some questions. What's going wrong? Is anything going wrong? Is this a false positive? And keep in mind, it is very good if you're finding false positives. There's a few reasons for this. The first one is that, well, there's nothing wrong. But the second one is that if you're not seeing false positives, you are almost certainly not seeing all of the true positives and you're probably missing things. You wanna also ask yourself who is affected? How many people? What characteristics do they have? Are they maybe different kinds of users like admins, employees, end users? Are they coming from a certain geographic region, a certain customer, other characteristics? So for example, when Google had the problem where it labeled pictures of some black people as apes, right? A, not okay. And B, you need to understand that you can't debug issues like that on everybody. You need to know who is affected. Then you want to look at whether it's an incident or a vulnerability. A lot of people use these terms interchangeably. They are not interchangeable. A vulnerability is a flaw in your systems or procedures, which could allow a bad thing to happen. An incident is when the bad thing actually happens. The remediation is different for these. In a remediation for an incident, you need to take care of the people who have been affected by the incident. Also, your legal obligations are probably different. You probably have to report to the local data protection authority, uh, maybe your users. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of things which cause incidents here. Uh, there's lots of them, everybody's stack is different, but these are particularly interesting or easy to diagnose from the outside. First one is employee er errors. Especially when people are doing privacy sensitive things manually, they are going to mess up. They just, they're people. And one of the things that is a problem that we can fall into is believing that our remit is the production system. And we don't remember that there's all of these other things going on. Privacy incidents can cover everything, not just your production systems. Another case is when your user says, well, I, I told your product to do this thing and then it did this other thing. Well, sometimes they just didn't read. Sometimes they forgot. I have gotten so many incident report reports where somebody said, well, I didn't turn on this feature. I didn't change, choose this setting. And I went back in the logs and I said, well, I see in here that it looks like you've turned up this on uh back last september and uh on your mobile phone and they go oh i totally did and they just forgot now both of these things are technically false positives but they are invaluable to making your product work because unless you are making some sort of creepy horror game freaking out your users is not the vibe you're going for it's really valuable feedback sometimes the users are right and your system is broken uh, one place that happens a lot is consent. Maybe you ask for the wrong consent. Maybe you ask for different consents in different areas of your, of your product somehow because the strings got out of sync. Maybe you were trying to roll it out and you rolled it out in some places and not others. Maybe you updated the product without updating the consent. Or maybe you updated the consent and you forgot about all the people who had, were already using the product. Sometimes the system is just not behaving how you want it to behave. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different classes of bugs. One of them is the Alice gets Bob data sometimes bugs. There's a few common causes for these. One of them is thread safety. So we have a thread inside the processor. Alice's uh, data is being handled by one thread. Bob's data is being handled by another thread. And then nobody used a lock and they start colliding with each other and somebody gets somebody else's data. Cache collisions. Sometimes we want to go and pull something out of the database or results of a computation and just store it in memory for the next time somebody asks. Well, if you don't, don't label what's in that cache really well according to who's, which user it is, Alice might get Bob's data sometimes. Or memory corruption. Uh, in the memory of the computer while you're doing some sort of computation, maybe Alice's data gets written into Bob's area or Bob's area data gets written into where we expect to have Alice's data. That's bad. Another place is where somebody says, well, this is a bug, but if you look at the actual behavior that's taking place, the behavior is correct. It's just being applied at the wrong time. Sometimes this is a logic error. Somebody flipped a less than sign or something, but sometimes it's a protocol error. So for example, you might have uh, a new version of a protocol rolling out and it changes the behavior of some of the fields. So for example, you might have the client saying, 
you should take this data and make sure it is private. And the server says, yes, I will take this data and publish it publicly on the internet. And both sides think they're fine and it's not. Another one is a, is a type error. So the client says, uh, this is my timestamp. And the server is like, this is my user ID. And this does not go well either. Another one is more of like a very classic type error where the client might say, this is a list and the server's like, I know how to deal with integers and this does not, this is very bad. Another case is your ML model doesn't do what it's supposed to. And honestly, the root cause here is that you're using ML. The reason why you use ML is because it does things that you didn't program it to do. Just some of them are gonna be bad. A lot of the time, the fact that it's doing a bad thing comes down to bad signals. You took, you took different parts of the world and put them in the ML model and you put the wrong parts in or a biased data set. And that doesn't just mean, so I put white people in and I forgot everybody else. Sometimes it's very subtle stuff like the background color and it will start asking, uh, the ML model will start spitting out weird things because the ML model is not a human brain. Sometimes it's insufficient data. Somebody goes and says, oh, machine learning is fancy and I'm going to use it and I'm going to put this data in and you're like, that's not enough data to make that work. But something comes out the other side, it just doesn't behave very well. You should be testing better. You, that's how you deal with this sort of thing, right? You look at your human centric threat model and you say, well, what are all of the things that could hurt or offend one of my users or somebody affected by my system? Let's just run them all through there and see what happens. If you're not taking pictures of poop and putting them through your ML model, you're probably missing things. The next step is to stop the bleeding. We want to stop the bad thing from going wrong. Now, this is not necessarily the same thing as actually fixing the thing, right? We just want to stop it at this point. So you should design your service in advance for doing quick stops. Uh, taking down the service, big red button, just make it go away. Binary rollback, maybe the new version of your system has a bug, the old version is fine. Can you get from the new one to the old one really fast? Selective blocking of network uh, requests. So you might say, well, network, I'm just gonna take all of these network requests and just pretend they don't exist for a while. That can be a little brittle, but it can be very useful. Feature flagging, which you should have anyways, where you can say this particular feature is on or off for any particular user. Well, that's really great in an emergency because you can say, okay, sharing is off. No one has sharing. It, it just doesn't work anymore. And then you can turn it back on once you fixed it. A messy or partial fix is often better than no fix. Even if you put a fix in and then you have to immediately fix your fix, still usually better than nothing. And here's where it gets tricky because you have to remember you can't unleak someone's data. This is not money. It's not fungible. You can't stop the bad thing from happening and go back in time. But if you're noisy about how you fix it or you're not careful in your fix, your fix could have a bug or you can cause your users more problems by being noisy. So for example, if you have leaked some personal data about people and then you say, well, one thing I could do is I could take down the service and, be, and tell everybody a bad thing happened. But if there's another copy of the data over here, well, at that point, you're just saying, Hey, I have a bad privacy issue. I have a bad privacy issue. Go look here. And that can actually cause more harm to users. The choices can be very convoluted and very tricky. Think about them in advance. This third step is cleaning up the blood. So let's talk about short-term remediation versus long-term remediation. Short-term remediation fixes the problem. So for example, I have a bad cookie on my website. Ooh, don't like that. I'm going to remove that cookie but that may still leave my system in a brittle state. Somebody could just go and put the cookie back. Actually, maybe if I just do a new binary release, the cookie will come back. So that's not good. We also need to do longer term remediation to get from a not broken state into a good state. So in our cookie example, we might scan for other unexpected cookies, uh, make sure that we're checking our code, scanning our third party code and scanning our add-ons before they're added to our website in the future. Or even better, we could make active guards against setting cookies which aren't allowed. And an active guard is always better than, a, than monitoring for things because an active guard will stop your problem from happening. Monitoring will tell you you have a problem, which is way better than nothing, but it's not our perfect one. So how do we know which things to do? That is something we go through in the postmortem, which I'm gonna talk about next. But first I wanna make a note about humans and remediation. 
there's a lot of remediation that needs to happen immediately, right? We know we need to do it, we're just gonna do it, it'll get done. But there are some cases where the right answer may be putting off some of that remediation. And in that case, you wanna fight this normal human tendency to put this off and in the favor of kind of shiny feature work. So I wanna align my incentives when I get into that state. So for example, if there's a bunch of manual work that my team needs to do to keep that problem from recurring, I wanna make sure that the team who needs to fix the problem also feels that pain, right? That they have, they have a very um, upfront incentive to uh, remediate that. So maybe they have to work with me on it. They have to do a bunch of that work. Or maybe I have their VP sign in blood that it's going to get fixed by a particular time. There's a couple of reasons why this works. One of them is that well, the VP honestly only has a little bit of time. They can't spend all day going and saying, no, you don't need to fix your thing right now. You don't need to fix your thing. You don't need to fix your thing. Also, they don't want to take a whole bunch of risk. They want their product to remain a product and remain in a good state. Another thing is that product teams don't like showing up and being like, hello, VP. Please uh, give me an exception because my product and or, and or system is not working very well and I would like to remain it in a state where it doesn't work well, right? Most VP, nobody wants to say that to their VP. So that can, those things that can help move that along. So let's talk about postmortems. Postmortems are where we sit down and we learn what went well, what went poorly, what happened and why. And our goal of doing a postmortem is to avoid this incident and related classes of incident. So what are we doing? We're gonna look for our underlying causes say, well, this happened, what happened, caused this, what caused this, what caused this, at least three times, go deeper. So for example, if we have somebody who went and clicked a button and they caused the data set to be visible to everyone inside the company, well, that's not good, but we could blame that person or we could say, why do I have that button? What is that button even for? How did we get to a state where we had the button? Maybe we fixed the button. And then we want a blameless postmortem because otherwise people are gonna hide things, right? People will come up with all sorts of reasons when really what we wanted to do was just make the, make the bug go away. We just want it to not happen again. And that person, like that person who clicked that button, they know, now know better than anybody else what happens when you click that button. If you just go fire them, you're not actually reducing the number of people who could click the button in the future. So uh, I'm not saying that you never wanna fire people. Like, so for example, when Twitter had that problem where they had an insider attacker who sold data to the Saudi intelligence service, like that's really bad and you should definitely fire them. But the postmortem meeting is also not where to discuss that. The postmortem meeting would be where you discuss, hey, how do we make our system more resilient to insider attackers? And then we can go and look for related issues. And fix and guard against all of these issues. We can talk about things like fixing bugs, hardening systems. We can avoid failure modes or make active guards against failures. We can reduce access. We can use, we can get better monitoring and alerting and we can do training. Now this shouldn't be your first line of uh, defense. It shouldn't be your second line of defense, but make sure that your privacy and security teams know what's going wrong at the very least. And you can also use this to improve your incident response process, right? Are you finding the right people? And that includes things like legal and comms, privacy, security, and the engineers who are working on that incident. Were they able to find the data that they needed in order to debug that incident? Were they able to remediate that incident quickly? You should be looking at your incidents to improve your incidents. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I've also put up for you a sample incident document. This is the document that um, I wrote at Humu. That's the one that our auditors said was great and they wished everybody used it. So if you want it, it is totally yours. Thank you to Humu for, for donating that. I've also included some bonus content in my slides because I wrote too much. So if you want to know things about which metrics help you in handling incidents, and which ones can cause things to go pretty horribly awry, look up my slides later. Thank you.